Okay, thank you. So if you're okay, I'll ask you the first question. Okay. All right, so the first one um, we're gonna start with is uh, about a patient with no prior history of asthma. Asthma was identified at the time of her EGPA diagnosis at age 56. She had coughing, shortness of breath, wheezing, pulmonary nodules. All of her respiratory symptoms resolved almost immediately with treatment, which is great, and high dose steroids and IV cyclophosph cyclophosphamide. In a follow-up, they had a they did a, a pulmonary function test and CT lung and uh, CT lung were all normal, and respiratory med medications were discontinued. So the question is: Seven years later, there's been no reoccurrence of any respiratory trouble, and she's remaining in remission on Celsept only. So she wants to know if she considers herself to have asthma at this yeah. point. So. That that's a difficult question, uh, and I would frame it in a little bit broader sense. And I alluded to that in the presentation. So not everything that is wheezing is true asthma. And first, we want to make sure that whatever was called asthma or wheezing wasn't due to something else going on in the airways. Now, in GPA, we would very much look at the tracheobronchial tree and make sure that there is no narrowing of the large airways. In a patient with eGPA, of course, asthma is the most common presentation and often precedes the vasculitis manifestations of the disease. So in a patient who has a true diagnosis of eGPA, what was there at the beginning was probably asthma. Now, asthma can come and go. We very often have asthma unrelated to vasculitis in childhood and early teenage years. And as the patient gets older and reaches adulthood, the asthma may go away. Then there are patients who never had asthma in their childhood who develop asthma later in their life. So asthma can come and go. So the answer to this specific question of this patient is that if the asthma has not shown itself on breathing test or with symptoms for seven years, then it is probably gone or in remission. I presume that the patient is not receiving any inhaled treatments for asthma, which control the asthma symptoms. Because if the patient still was on inhaled steroids, I would say the asthma is probably adequately treated, but I would not go off the inhaled steroids because the inhaled steroids control the asthma. They prevent the symptoms of asthma from developing, but it asthma may not be gone. Now, if the patient is on no respiratory medicines and breathing test is normal and there are no respiratory symptoms and it's just the cell sept in the background, that may also control the inflammation adequately. But I, I would say whether you still call it as persistent asthma or history of asthma is probably not so important. What is more important is to be aware of the possibility that asthma could come back and then treat it adequately. And if it doesn't need any treatment in the meantime, um, that's great. So, but again, asthma can also disappear in, in patients. Well, thank you for that answer. Before we go on, Dr. Specs, would you mind um, discontinuing sharing your screen so that we can oh, see? Oh, absolutely. It would be lovely to see you speaking. Oh, yeah. And I will work on the next question. Great. Perfect. So uh, the next question is, during my last GPA flare, nodes on my lungs were detected. Why does this happen? What does it mean? What are the long-term effects? I know you talked about it a little bit in your presentation, but if you have some answers on that, it would be great. Yeah, so there were quite a few questions on uh, nodule spots and masses and granulomatous lesions. So in GPA, the granulomatous inflammation manifests itself in the lung in the form of 
these nodules that I showed you on the CAT scan images, these round spots that are essentially cuts through little spheres or balls that are sitting in your lungs caused by the granulomatous inflammation of GPA. Now, you can have similar nodules in the situation of cancer. So the imaging doesn't really tell us what they're caused by. So that's why some patients have originally been told by their doctors that they had metastases in their lung and they had a very short time to live. And then we see them and say, no, you don't have cancer. You have what's now called GPA and we can treat this. And uh, so, but the, the image itself doesn't tell us what it is. So we very often need to look at the whole patient and see whether there are other signs or symptoms of vasculitis. And if we can't tell by that or by an anchor test or this, that, and the other, we sometimes have to do a biopsy of one of these nodules. And that tells us whether it's a cancer or whether it's GPA. So, and you know, as you probably have gotten through this presentation, there are different terms that are being used, nodules, or spots or masses if they're bigger or cavitation if there is a hole in them. And they're generally in the lung. Now, there was one question that I saw come through where it said it was a spot on my lung. And so th that's just jargon. It really means uh, the on the X-ray, which is a two-dimensional representation of something, there's something that doesn't belong there. So on the X-ray, on the lungs, there is a nodule or a spot, but it really means there is something in the lung tissue that is really showing up as a spot on a chest röntgenogram. Now, um, there, do you want me to go through some other question or you want to well, uh, throw well, the questions actually, at me? Yeah, we actually had a patient today, a participant today, asked something related to what you were just talking about that I think we need to we could maybe expand on. They asked what causes a nodule to become cavitated? Okay, so yeah, so I tried to cover that. Um, so in essence, when uh, a nodule is, you know, the, essentially the, in the center of the nodule becomes dead tissue. So, and then when the inflammation is surrounding an airway or gets access to an airway, then this dead tissue in the center of the nodule can be coughed up through the airway and leave the lung and leave an empty space or a cavity behind. So that's how these cavities evolve out of these larger nodules when the dead center of it uh, you know gets uh, you know coughed out through the through the airway. Oh interesting. Okay, um, I'll move on with some of the questions that were similar also. This one was, I was diagnosed in February of this year with MPA, hospitalized for 11 days with severe lung involvement. My doctor has since seen my scans and said my lungs were so bad. It was amazing that I survived or didn't at least need to be intubated. As far as my lungs are concerned, I have recovered completely and I'm on tabneos and infusions of rituximab. My question is, when the air quality says unhealthy for sensitive groups, should I stay indoors with my air filters running? I thought that was a great question. It is a great question. Well, congratulations, first of all, that you pulled through this very acute phase of alveolar hemorrhage. I had shown some CT scans. You saw how much of the lung gets filled up with blood. And when the, the depending on how much T lung tissue is filled up with blood that tells us how bad you are. And sometimes patients end up on the respirator for quite some time uh, because otherwise they can't get enough oxygen in, in their bloodstream. This is an acute situation. And fortunately, we have good drugs these days. And Tavnios is actually one drug that is very effective in immediately shutting down the inflammation in the tiny capillaries in the lungs that is leading to alveolar hemorrhage. We've had very good success with this drug in that very acute and life-threatening situation. So uh, congratulations that you're doing much better. And it sounds like you, your blood out of your lungs has completely cleared. And that is typical for when we can treat alveolar hemorrhage 
quickly and effectively before it gets so bad that you end up on the respirator for long periods of time and then other problems can can occur. And uh, so if your lungs have recovered from this acute alveolar hemorrhage, then the question about air quality, fortunately for you, may become less of an issue because your lungs will return to normal in most cases after alveolar hemorrhage. And they are not at increased risk anymore from bad air quality or so on. This is different for asthmatics or patients with EGPA where the bad air quality is an irritant to the airways and can trigger asthma attacks. Now, someone who has a lot of damage in the lungs and has already low oxygen saturations and needs oxygen supplementation, for them, certainly uh, exposure to bad air quality is also bad. But I think of all these patients and all these possible scenarios where bad air quality can affect patients with uh, lung damage from vasculitis negatively, um, I think hopefully your lung has fully recovered and uh, you're not at very high risk of uh, from bad air quality. Now that said, common sense applies. We all should avoid exposure to bad air quality. And if the warnings are out, we probably all should stay inside. And I, for my part, skip my regular morning walk on days like that because the bad air quality is not helping my lungs. So if I skip the walk for a day or two is probably better than, than forcing your regular exercise routine through bad air quality. Well, thank you for that answer. I think we all need to pay attention to that. Uh, I did, we've gotten so many questions today. I want to throw some out there that are not in the list of previous submitted, but might have something similar to what previous submitted have been. One of them is, is there anything on the horizon that might be long-term answer for, for subglottal stenosis? Uh, that is a very good question. Um, so all cases with subglottic stenosis are really individual cases and need to be looked at as individuals because the recurrence of subglottic stenosis is extremely variable. In some patients, um, you know, the narrowing disappears with immunosuppressive treatment and it's never becoming an issue again. In others, it scars down and it requires dilatation procedures and injection with long-acting steroid and mitomycin C that prevents the proliferation of the fibroblasts, the little cells that make the scars. And then when that is done, some patients have very long periods of time where they don't need any other treatment, but in some patients, it comes back and requires repeated dilatation procedures. Now, we do try to control any potential recurrent disease activity uh, by keeping patients on maintenance treatment with rituximab. And in some instances, that has led to an extension of the intervals between required dilatation procedures. But um, at the moment, that is pretty much all we have. Now, there may be down the road some new drugs that uh, affect the process of fibrosis and scarring that may prove to be effective in this context or in other forms of fibrosis. A lot of research is going on in uh, terms of new drugs that stop fibrosis and scarring in a variety of conditions. So I would be hopeful that in 20 or 30 years, we have other tools in our toolkit to uh, address subglottic stenosis also, yes. So I would be optimistic, but there is no immediate fix on the horizon, I'm, I'm afraid. Well, it's there are so many questions here. We have like four minutes left. So I'm, I'm going to, instead of asking you more of these questions, I'm going to um, tell everybody what we plan to do with all of these questions. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you so much, Dr. Spex. Uh, I cannot tell you how many comments we got in the chat box about 
how easy it was to understand your presentation and how much people appreciate it. So I just want to make sure that I tell you that there were loads and loads of Thank comments. You. We really appreciate it. And we have run out of time today. And I realize we didn't get all to all the questions, but the good news is that we are going to do a follow-up recorded webinar. Webinar. It won't be live, but we're going to do a follow-up recorded webinar with Dr. Uh, Dr. Fussner, who is going yes. to Mm -hmm. answer as many of these questions as she can that we didn't get to. So Perfect. we'll do our best to record all the questions that we got today and make sure that we try and get the answers to everybody. That will be put on the Vasculitis Foundation website along with today's webinar. So we hope we will have more answers for you all in the future. So thank you to everybody that submitted questions because that's how we all learn and we appreciate that so, so much. And thank you to Dr. Specs for your time that you You're gave welcome. us today. You're welcome. You're welcome. And, um, also, the Vasculitis Foundation for import, for uh, hosting these important webinars. And just want to quickly say there are a couple of great ways to stay informed. And one of the best ways is the Vasculitis Foundation website, which is vasculitisfoundation.org. Um, they have all kinds of features like find a doctor in addition to these webinars. So if you're looking for more information, that's a great way to stay informed. Any final words, Dr. Specs, before we say goodnight to everybody? Well, thank you very much for the opportunity, and I'm glad I could answer many questions. And uh, please uh, tune in to listen to Dr. Fussner. Uh, she is a great pulmonologist, and um, as you know, she is trained here at Mayo Clinic, and I'm very happy to see how she's succeeding at uh, in um, Columbus, Ohio, and uh, setting up a vasculitis center there. And uh, so you you have a great follow up on on this. So thank well, you. Thank, thank you so much. And thank you for your help today. And uh, with that, we'll say good night to everybody today. Thank you.